All right. Well, welcome everybody to the natural world. We're here for a momentum artist presentation with Kim Trowbridge. My name is Kristen Tollefson and I am the education director at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art and I'm delighted that you're here on this beautiful spring afternoon. This year, our Momentum series, which is a platform for sharing art and ideas and primarily new art and ideas, is centered on the natural world. And we're delighted that this idea came to us thanks to the exhibit of Kim's work. I'd like to start this uh, program with a land acknowledgement and uh, just call to attention that the land on which we all are is indigenous land. Um, the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art is situated on Suquabsh land. Um, we pronounce uh, the anglicized version of Suquabsh is Suquamish. So we acknowledge that the land on which we gather is within Aboriginal territory of the Suquabsh, people of clear salt water. Expert fishers, canoe builders, and basket weavers, the Suquabsh live in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington's central Salish Sea as they have for thousands of years. Here the Suquabsh live and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future generations as promised by the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. We pay respects to their elders past and present. This is a good time for you to consider the land where you are and the history and legacy that has preceded and continues today. Um, as I mentioned, the Momentum Festival includes a variety of art forms. We've had artist talks, book talks, um, we had a lovely workshop yesterday. As you can see, Kim's talk is today and we have a couple more events coming up. Another book talk. We have a film, a mini film series of Clyde Peterson's delightful shorts coming up on the 29th. And we have a musical concert, um, Danny Godinez. We could not have done this without the support of staff, at BIMA, as well as the support of the PRISM, the PRISM Fund, which funds our cultural programming at BIMA and um, enables us to reach beyond the capacity of what museums have done in the past. We also get funds from, the Kits from Kitsap County and the city of Bainbridge Island. I'm especially delighted to welcome Kim today because there are so many reasons to be just loving on the natural world. And what I think that what I think Kim brings is a really interesting intersection between humans and the natural environment. Um, the connection to Bloedel Reserve is a very special connection for me, having I grew up nearby. And I understand the, the really stark contrast between what happens on that campus and what happens in the woods and mountains that I spent a lot of my time growing up. It's, it's a, a very close relationship and also very divergent. And I think that Kim does a really lovely job of captivating us with things that we respond to and drawing us in to questions about our own relationships to being viewers and participants in the environment around us. Um, I know that you came to hear her talk and without any further delay, I'd like to welcome Kimberly Trowbridge. Oh, and I'm sorry, one more thing before Kim starts. Uh, you'll notice that there is a Q&A uh, button down at the bottom of your screen. I will be monitoring questions and answers during Kim's talk. We will have time for a Q&A afterward. And um, the chat is only designed to communicate with the panelists. So um, you are welcome to communicate with us directly there. But please post your questions and we'll consider those at the end. 
Thank you so much, Kristen, for that intro. And huge thank you to both Bima and Lodell for the continued generosity and support for my artistic vision and dream that I've been working on for now three years, amazingly. I'm gonna hop right into sharing my screen with you so we can see some images of my project. So as you know, my show here at Bainbridge Island Museum of Art is entitled Into the Garden. And I love this title and it was with me for a long time in my thoughts because I love the into part, uh, that kind of action or that verb of going from one space and into another space. And so it's that kind of dissolving of the self that happens when moving into the garden. This project started three years ago, almost exactly, in May of 2018. It was my first time being a creative resident at Bloedel Reserve, this amazing program where artists, composers, thinkers, writers get to come and live at the gardens for a three-week period. And I got so in touch with and connected and just really fell in love with the gardens and felt real potential for my own poetic narratives to really blossom in that space that I begged and begged to be able to come back. And what that ended, what ended up happening is we developed a program, a creative fellowship so that I could return for multiple visits over a two year period. And so this whole project really comes out of my first first-hand uh, dialogue with some specific, what I call theaters at Bloedel Reserve. And so here I am actually more recently, uh, really um, embedded in one of my very favorite gardens, the Camellia Trails. Uh, this gives you a really good vision of just the richness of the Pacific Northwest colors, the palette that I respond to so much. And what I wanna say here, just as we're getting started, is that one of the big connections that I felt immediately with Bloedel is of course the beautiful gardens, but the mission and the vision behind the shaping of the gardens and the continuation through their programming is really inspiring to me in that, I think many of you have heard this quote by Prentice Blodell, who designed, um, organized the gardens, but he says, nature can do without man, but man cannot do without nature. And so a big part of the mission of these gardens is really emphasizing the essential, the essential or the necessity of nature to human well-being, to human growth and consciousness. And so that kind of mental health, emotional health that happens when we emerge ourselves uh, with these beautiful dialogue of plants and color and form is really in line with my own thinking as a painter. And so Bloedel in particular really touched me in that way. And so I felt like in a way I was coming home uh, to my proper laboratory being able to work and live at Bloedel. And so during my time coming uh, to Bloedel for multiple visits over the last few years, I fell in love with a few specific gardens. Uh, one of them is the Camellia Walk or otherwise called the Camellia Trail. And the richness of the colors in this particular part of the garden just really gets me. And I just love these gangly, gothic looking chandeliers of the camellias that are allowed to just be their crazy misshapen selves uh, with the backdrop of old growth forest and a beautiful floor covering of fluorescent colored green oxalis. And so this is where I very first started to kind of crawl out of the house into the trails and start to dabble with color and kind of find my bearings in the garden. And so these are the very first beginnings of me trying to organize color, form, shape, and rhythm. And so these are some beginnings of paintings I started again in May, 2018. So just three years ago now. And something that I love about this particular garden is the relationship between really saturated moments that happen in the 
blossoms of these camellias against the more neutral, darker background of the forest. And as a painting idea, to me, it's just incredibly intoxicating and exciting. Uh, these camellia blossoms, again, against this uprooted tree, just this wall of roots that now have oxalis dangling on them. And so here again on that trail with a completed painting that I did here, uh, you can see that the light had passed through a little bit and then changed back to my favorite more kind of overcast scene here. A little close up on that. And the sword ferns amid the oxalis. And something you'll notice here with these plein air works on the field I don't think anyone would accuse me of being a realist painter. So what I'm really after is not a photographic or a realist rendition of what I'm looking at, but rather to create a dialogue with my paint, a dialogue between me and nature, my body sentiently responding to rhythm, to color relationships, to shape. And so I'm really after a kind of sensation that ultimately I like to be surprised by. And this is a view of one of my plein air uh, palette boxes. And I really like to think of my palette as a keyboard of colored notes and the act of plein air painting. So actually painting from nature, in nature, I feel that I am playing the chords and harmonies from her and that I learn everything I need to know from her. So here are some of those first completed paintings from that first year I was at Blodell, Camellias in the Forest. This is in the current show here at Bema. Again, you can see those spots of saturation amid that darker, deep forest, a very Pacific Northwest kind of scene. And Camellia, Sword Fern, and Oxalis. So these smaller pieces here, I really consider as my primary documents, meaning because these were developed on site, that they are raw data for me. And then I collect these and take these primary documents back into my studio to create the larger, more conceptual studio pieces. But so these smaller plein air works have a really, really special place in my heart because they really, you know, they're the real documents of me standing there and sensing the color and space in the world. Um, this is a studio piece done at Blodell, so kind of a conglomeration of different memories of those primary documents combined into a slightly larger painting. And then back in Seattle in the studio, uh, using some photographic references for the specificity of this piece, really going in after the particularity of petal and leaf shape of the scene that has captivated me for so long. And then a more recent piece of that same motif, uh, this Camellias in the Forest is also on view here in the current show. When we enter the garden, we enter an erotics of perception. Our consciousness vibrates and mingles, moving into and among the other forms of the earth. The rhythm of the ferns is our rhythm, our pulse. That's something that I love so much about being in nature and that I felt so strongly on this camellia trail. Every time I walk into it, I feel that I'm being seen or recognized or that the boundaries of the self kind of dissolve or loosen or fall apart. And in particular, the rhythm of the ferns. I love that it, the way that looking at the ferns makes my body tingle. And so something I like to do out on the field in addition to taking color notes in the form of paintings is to do some simple just ink on paper sketches to really start to get to know that rhythmic form. 
Or sometimes I'll zoom out a little bit and sketch just the way the light or volumes exist in a larger space, a kind of theatrical scene, very abstractly, almost like walking into the room with the lights off and your eyes start to adjust and start to see some of those forms unfold in front of you. This was a painting that I started there also in the Camellia Walk. And you can see the beginning of the painting there on the left. And a really important transition that happened to me this very first visit was that with that same painting here, again, I'll go back the colored version, going back the next day to the same site, I found myself painting over those saturated colored shapes with shapes of black, gray, and white. And I was confused by why I was doing that. But one of my little gifts I give myself is to go with it, to allow my body to kind of make decisions on the painting. And I really found that that thirst or that hunger for going more tonal or approaching it more as value-based painting was a desire and a search to be more tactile, to understand the forms a little bit more, whereas color can be kind of ephemeral or almost fickle in a way. I wanted to really get down to the bones and the roots of what exactly I was seeing and sensing. And so this flipping back and forth between color and tone has been a really important part of this entire body of work. And this is the very first painting where that conversation started to happen. And so this piece has a really special place in my heart. And so I often will also do some video work while I am working on different projects as a different way of sensing and being part of a narrative. It's also often a way for me to place my own body inside of the work in a literal way so that then I can create more poetic figurative allegories based on the human condition using this data. And so taking those film stills or uh, film or screenshots from that video work that I did and doing a lot of printouts of that, cutting it up, deconstructing it, collaging it back together back in the studio, started to create these kind of rhythms or sequences of figures, dividing those up almost like a time sequence or a musical score uh, to create the sense of kind of moving through time, moving through time into the garden. And Pretty early on uh, with my creative fellowship at Blodell, uh, we began speaking with and in partnership with BEMA. And so I knew that I was gonna have the whole upstairs space here at BEMA. And so I created a little three-dimensional model and began constructing the large panel pieces and mounting those panels with paper. Uh, so I created all of the paintings in the show specifically for this space and how I wanted the work to create a certain tempo and have a certain scale with walking through the space. And so with that collage data from these figures moving through the garden, I began these large frieze-like paintings in the studio, which eventually become my camellia walk panels. And then I went away to teach for a portion of the summer in Mount Gretna, Pennsylvania. And I had these paintings in the studio going on in process and I missed them. I wanted to be with them. And so I ended up doing these two small oil on paper pieces uh, so that I could kind of carry uh, the momentum with me. I could kind of carry the rhythm and ideas. And so I could ended up making these paintings there while I was away from the paintings as a kind of love poem or love song in a way so that I could continue living with them. So another theater, in addition to the Camellia Walk that I have an enormous uh, love for is the Moss Garden. And anyone who's been at Blodell, um, I think probably feels the same. This is just a very unique and special place to spend time. What we have here is this ground of mustardy yellow colored moss. We have these gorgeous old growth cedar trees that are shaped very figuratively and gesturally. We have these soft, beautiful bows of the hemlock tree coming down. Uh, 
And we also have the incredible skunk cabbages that are in bloom right now. So be sure to get to Bloedel soon. I got really interested in these fleshy kind of monsters of the skunk cabbages. And so my very first uh, primary uh, document that I made in the moss garden was a celebration or a kind of portrait of this particular skunk cabbage. And I was so interested in the way the light, uh, when the light touches the leaf from above, we were getting this kind of colder bluish light versus the leaves where the light is passing through are transparently illuminated and create this really wonderful, vibrant, uh, yellow, orangish green. Um, and so it was those, that was the color relationship that kind of got me into the painting at first, and then just really fell in love with the fleshy featheriness, almost like a green ostrich roosting on the floor of the moss. This is that complete piece here, skunk cabbage, also in the current show. And then some scenes where I zoomed out a little bit to show the cedars and the moss, uh, kind of abstract flickering through that space of the skunk cabbage, creating a pathway through the composition. And another one here. And some of the sketches that I did in this garden as well, especially on the left there, we can see that skunk cabbage um, near a little ravine uh, moving up towards an old growth cedar. And then another studio painting where, again, just using the memory of working in that space, I find that when I do a plein air painting, uh, that act of standing outside and observing and absorbing in my body, that my body holds a really strong sense of that place, of the color relationships. And so I actually very rarely look at my primary documents when I'm creating my studio pieces. It's more a memory of that color and that rhythm that lives inside of my body that in a way I'm kind of excavating or revealing through the studio process. And so another really important theater for me at Bloedel is of course the reflecting pool, this incredible geometric green room that you walk into. It's a very meditative space. It can be actually rather shocking walking into it because it's uh, so different than so many of the other gardens. And so you can approach it through the moss garden or through the camellia walk. And it's so austere and so massive. It kind of catches your breath or takes your breath away. The first time I walked into this space, I remember it very clearly. I walked around the corner and saw this perfect mirror reflection of the universe. And only moments later, a duck came in and landed on the water and shattered that whole image of the universe through its waves. And I just thought that was such a beautiful metaphor for life and for art and for self-perception that it's crystal clear and then it's completely deconstructed and then realigns itself. So this space is really a spiritual space for me. And every once in a while, we get to see this incredible strand of light moving through those cedars in late afternoon. And to me, it is a very mystical experience. So here's just some images of this incredible geometry. And when we zoom in on these photographs in a way like this, I love the flattening of the space where we can't tell what's real or what's the reflection. And so the very first plein air painting I did in this theater is called uh, Reflecting Pool Double Cedar. And so it's this reflection of the cedar tree and kind of zoomed in on it here. And again, creating that grid-like, almost quilt-like structure where it's, all, it's hard to tell what's forward and what's behind, what's real and what's reflected. And a tonal piece here where you can see this is another piece that started with color, but what I really wanted to know was the shape 
and the tactility and the rhythm of that wall of cedars above the hedge. Um, it was around this time too that I found out that Prentice Blodell was actually colorblind. And so I felt like I was really picking up on that sort of formal way of seeing things as form and rhythm rather than color. This is an image just of those cedar trees above that hedge. And then playing around with that geometry. So we both have the above and the below, but what if that's intersected and swapped and flipped in different ways? This is a conversation I'd love to continue or a dialogue I'd love to continue in the work uh, that new shapes are found in that. So it's kind of an exciting thread I'd like to pick up again. And some of the sketches, every day I would go and do multiple sketches. So this reflecting pond really lives in my heart, in my mind. Um, I can kind of pull it up at any point that I need to and use it as a theater uh, for interactions in painting. I love it. And so here are some of the pieces that I created from that as well. And so this is one of those weird studio pieces where, again, I'm not looking at it, I'm not perceiving it directly, but rather from doing the drawings and the other plein air paintings, I'm able to recreate a feeling of it or a memory of it. And again, the figure comes in. For me, the figure always comes in, and especially in this context. We're in a garden here, we're not in wild nature. We are in a space that is very consciously cultivated and articulated by human consciousness. The human is so much a part of what a garden is. And the figure throughout art history is very important to me as this kind of allegorical uh, gesture of humanity. And so I created these figure studies just trying to imagine what it would look like being reflected. And so these are just invented. I've actually never shown these to anyone. You guys are the first. And this figure began to really become important to me, the figure at the reflecting pond. And this figure started to morph very clearly to me, poetically, into the figure of Persephone. So the goddess that uh, transverses or transgresses both the upper world and the underworld. And I love that idea of the figure that has access to multiple worlds, living kind of on that edge between things. And to me, that's the figure of the artist, uh, the sort of courage to leap into that underworld and to bring knowledge of that to the upper world or vice versa, what's real, what's invented, the role of the artist to kind of mingle and mix and confuse what is sacred, what is profane. And so also you can see here, not just with the metaphor of Persephone, but also this mixture of the idea of tone or working with value and color. And so that moment that happened of me switching to tone in the garden uh, became a really fun thing to play with the geometry within the geometry of the reflecting pond to be able to flip that. Which world are we in? Which part of seeing? This one's called Kim and Coyote. And then abstracting the figural form even further into these gestures or what I call runes, kind of a hieroglyphics or a kind of letters in the alphabet spelling out a significant meaning that maybe we can't yet understand. And I feel like that with painting, that it's all these colors and shapes and signs moving towards constructing some greater meaning. And I feel that way in nature too. I love looking through sticks and leaves and blades of grass, like they're all clues into the history of who I am and who we are. 
So these runes reflected pieces are very special to me. They feel like me exposing my kind of inner alphabet. And so this idea of twilight starts to mingle in, no surprise, that idea of living on the edge of night and day, of tone and color. So I really started working with this value-based uh, palette and really trying to see how far I could go into really getting a sense of tactility and depth just with working tonally. And did a whole series of these wonderful Doug fir trees that are on the back deck of the residency where I stay at Bloedel and just fell in love with these creatures. And working also with this gray, even light is something that I love so much about working in the Pacific Northwest. I feel that it really allows the colors of the plant life and form to kind of glow or radiate outwards without being kind of distracted by a sunny day. And so some of these paintings really, um, conceptually they're about that edge of twilight because actually a lot of these purples here are just tonally black. Like what we read is somewhat purple here, that's just gray and black. And so the paintings themselves started to really mingle tone and value in an interesting way for me. So formally they're twilight, but also uh, literally twilight. I began painting outside through twilight. So starting paintings in the late afternoon and working on them through that twilight hour. And that's when the colors to me, I think I'm a very crepuscular being. I think I thrive in the hour of twilight that these colors start to really announce themselves. These are all from that back deck view of the residence. Also that edge of the fence, another kind of geometry that intersects the picture plane, similar to the way the reflecting pond did. For me, I love that sort of boundary of seeing the thing, but maybe being held back by the thing or being right on the prow of paradise or the ship, being a witness where you're on that edge of, am I in it or am I separate from it? But showing that physical line there, I love that. Here's a very strange piece, very different than any of the other pieces in the show where I create that upper underworld, but really flip the things we're looking at. So we have that twilighted dug for forest at top, and then we have Persephone at the reflecting pond on the bottom. It's a very meaningful painting for me. And so formally those are about twilight, but again, as I said, also literally painting through into the darkness. You can see my delicious palette here. And this painting, I painted like a scroll, basically. I started at the left side um, while it was still light out and painted and painted and painted until I came to the right side when it was actually really dark out. And so this primary document actually becomes a record of me working through that twilight hour where my cones and my rods are shifting. And so this painting is a document of an actual physical and perceptual transformation that is occurring. And that's really interesting to me. And so got a little sneak peek of Truckee over there on the left coming in. And so we just got to take a little moment to honor Truckee in the woods. I just can't get over how adorable my purple truck looks at Bloedel. <laughs> She's the sweetest thing in the world. Obviously a very complex love relationship with carbon emissions, like not exactly a great thing for nature. And the flip side of that is this beautiful little emblem of, in a way, kind of my American dream, this little Ford pickup truck that me as a woman, independent, can drive, can put all my plein air gear in the back and take off and go to the woods. And so there's something about 
seeing her, knowing that she's how I got there, that she can carry my painting supplies. There's something just very moving and charming to me about her presence. <laughs> and so one of my favorite pieces in the show is called Truck in the Woods. And I can remember very clearly making this painting. Well, I should say, I remember after painting this painting and thinking what just happened. Like this is a painting I think of as my most psychedelic painting. I think that fall foliage is actually becoming the truck and the truck is becoming it. A lot of trance-like energy in that. But I painted it all in one long shot. And it was just one of those gift paintings where you really enter the zone and there's no thinking self. Like I do not remember being present for it at all. I only remember sort of waking up or coming to after it was finished. Poussin, what's he doing in here? Well, I must point out that a lot of how I see the world, how I think of picture making, and how I look at nature is through classical painting. In particular, Poussin, Nicolas Poussin gives me endless fodder through his studies. He was a French painter in the 1600s, but worked his whole life in the Italian Renaissance tradition. And so they look like Italian paintings. What I love about these works are the rhythm and the interaction of both the positive and the negative shapes. And so in a way, I see nature as a Renaissance painting that helps me sort of filter information and organize it into a composition. So to me, these two images are not so dissimilar. So I can, something that I look at and I do lots of these studies from these classical artists like Poussin, that that language of call and response between things is really how I'm looking at a complex scene like this and trying to make sense of it. Or sometimes I'll literally drop some Poussin figures into a Blodelian scene, as you can see here. Another beautiful one uh, by Nicholas Poussin. This one reminds me very much of the cedar trees in the moss garden. So if you can start to kind of see through my eyes how I'm looking at different characters on a stage when I'm looking at nature. So really seeing nature through the eyes of painting. And just so you know exactly what it looks like when I'm walking around Bloedel, this is what I see. I don't know about you, but there are lovers everywhere. And so back at the residence um, in the evenings, so after twilight, uh, I often do these painted master studies where again, I'm not a realist painter. It's not about copying the thing, but rather uh, editing out or excavating some of the rhythm from the piece and translating it in a new sort of personal way. So here's one of Bacchus and Ariadne. Again, to show you how I'm thinking about nature, you can kind of see the, the rhythm of cedar bows in the back of this one. And another one after Poussin. And so another theater, the theater of destruction that brings in the idea of death and cycles and decay. This is one of my favorite little scenes at Blodel. And this is what it looked like three years ago, or actually two years ago. The first year I was there, this was not there. When I came back several visits later and was walking around along the path at the meadow, turned around and saw this. It was after a big windstorm had created this kind of traumatic event. Um, I couldn't help but see these as characters in a Renaissance painting and just fell in love with them. Well, I'm staying at Blodel right now as well, and this is what it looked like yesterday. And so amazing to see this kind of fecundity, uh, this regrowth, um, this wonderful decomposition and then reconstructing of a new reality, which is one of the most hopeful poetic lessons that nature offers us as humans is that incredible cyclical dance. Uh, it's just 
incredible. So to me, this theater is about that. This was also taken yesterday, just a slightly different point of view on it. Just an incredible theater. The garden is the theater where we are embodied and reflected. The stories of our eternal birth and death surround us in the garden. Again, that lesson about those cycles, death into life into death into life, how we are a part of that. These are some of the smaller plein air on-site sketches I first did of the theater of destruction. And then a close-up, which is sort of unusual for me, but this I call wand, because all of that destruction, so these trees that have grown some for hundreds of years, and then this windstorm comes in, knocks them over, and strews across the ground thousands of what I think of as magical wands, these now dead sticks that have gestures and forms like those runic figures, letters in an alphabet that we haven't learned to read yet. But these cells in this mass that were part of a life that are now to me these magical emblematic wands. I felt like that my whole life since I was a little girl. I have felt the potency and magicalness of finding a particular shaped stick in the woods. Which brings us to this idea of Arcadia. Arcadia is synonymous with paradise or Eden. The garden is the stage for the cultivated growth of human consciousness. So when all these biblical and mythological stories about paradise, it's always also the stage upon which we gain consciousness, meaning an awareness of our mortality, a temporality enters. And so paradise and knowledge of our death are mutually bound together. Again, that theater of destruction and then the coming back to life. And so I love thinking of the garden as this theater, necessarily so, where death enters. And so here's a painting by Poussin called Et in Arcadia Ego, which means I am also in Arcadia. It's the voice of death saying I am also in paradise. The home where creative residents get to stay on the Bloedel grounds it's called the Education Center now, and it was built by the Cutler Anderson architects. And something that's fascinating about this to me and very Arcadian, if you will, is that the way that it was designed. So Prentice Blodell had it designed after his wife, Virginia, passed away. And so he was going to have this house to come stay in when they made Blodell a public park so he could stay kind of off of the public path but still come and visit as the park then became public and what's awesome is the architectural planning for the house is such that the access of the pillars that hold it up and the master bedroom have the same access that line up with here in the middle a boulder that's in the center of the meadow that then is in line with the headstone that was dedicated to his wife, Virginia, at the head of the reflecting pond. And so the whole structure of the house was built to focus and move the heart's vision to love, but also an acknowledgement of death. And I thought, this is Arcadia. And there is our tombstone at in Arcadia Ergo at the head of the reflecting pond. It's now named for Virginia and Prentice. Are not the best beloved of years around your heart forever? And so back to that reflecting pond piece, you can now notice that there's that headstone there, death in paradise. 
And this painting I call Sea of Ferns. It started in the Camellia Walk, but really developed more into a scene off that back deck of that home that was built for Prentice. And the back deck when you're standing on it feels like the prow of a ship and it feels like you're sailing through a sea of ferns and knowing that it's in line with that headstone, the shaft of light and these camellias to me became Virginia, became the beloved sailing back to her lover. And so the narratives, the poetry of the place of Blodell have really seeped into the ground soil of my creative vision here. Now I want to read you a poem by Mary Oliver called White Flowers. Those of you that study with me, I've read you this before. This is the closest I can get to expressing how I feel when I'm at Blodell. Last night in the fields, I lay down in the darkness to think about death. But instead I fell asleep as if in a vast and sloping room filled with those white flowers that open all summer, sticky and untidy in the warm fields. When I woke, the morning light was just slipping in front of the stars and I was covered with blossoms. I don't know how it happened. I don't know if my body went diving down under the sugary vines in some sleep sharpened affinity with the depths or whether that green energy rose like a wave and curled over me, claiming me in its husky arms. I pushed them away, but I didn't rise. Never in my life had I felt so plush or so slippery or so resplendently empty. Never in my life had I felt myself so near that porous line where my own body was done with and the roots and the stems and the flowers began. And now let us just enjoy the final paintings that I constructed for my exhibition. Light in the Forest, Annunciation. The Camellia Walk Panels. Light in the Cedars, Annunciation. Oracle Trees. Reflecting Pond, Persephone. Theater of Destruction. Owl, witnessing it all, nymph and skunk cabbage, to me an image of the transformation or a transfiguration, nymph and skunk cabbage tonal.
coyote coyote. The coyote is another crepuscular creature like Persephone living on the edge in many native stories and mythology, the trickster that moves between different worlds, swapping meaning. Legs. And the exhibition, such a fun part of putting this together was building this little 3D model uh, two and a half years ago, and then really getting to fill it with small little crayon drawings of the paintings as I was developing them. And thinking about the layout, it was really important for me for the show to have a really nice pacing as you walk through it. Uh, thinking about walking through a garden and when you turn a corner, new relationships are built between things. And so how we move through the space of the exhibition is a really big uh, part of what my vision is. Um, it's how the body moves and how the body creates relationships. I hope all of you listening get to come and actually see the show in person. Wonderful map of Blodell. I hope that you all can go there and visit as well. And here are small little thumbnails that they created to show where my paintings were created. Thank you all for being here. I hope you guys have some juicy questions for me. I wanna answer them, I wanna hear them, or I wanna try to answer them or ask further questions. Um, strange not to see any of you, but I'm feeling your energy. And I'm so thankful for all of your love and support. I have felt so loved by my community through this whole uh, process and project. And a special shout out to my amazing atelier students. I could not do this without you with me. I love exploring the world with you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. It's Kristen here. Just wait, there we go. Sorry, I didn't stop my screen share. Oh, thank you. That was so lovely. It felt like a, it did feel like a walk through Blodell. <laughs> I see the light changing outside and we're almost to that, um, that time that you're talking about that, I mean, where I can see the light lowering and I can just imagine it filtering through those leaves where you're just at the very end of your allowed time at Blodell and you're hustling through the moss <laughs> garden just to get a hit. Totally. Uh, um, you had some really nice notes here in the questions, which I will get to. Um, I, I am really struck by your references to theater mm. and um, they're, they're very, you know, they come at different places, like different qualities. They are, um, it's threaded through, and then some places it's very, you know, you talk about the different rooms at Blodell as theaters, and um, you have basically created these tableaus in each of the theaters. And um, I love that it is such an echo of what I believe was designed into the gardens at Blodell where you, I mean, the, you, you've really taken the intention of the garden and brought it into your work. I am curious to know how, um, what your, I, I wanted to dig a little deeper into this idea of archetypes and cycles and um, just see if there was something that you could add to what you've laid out that talks a little bit about your, like just as an overarching theme, 
your relationship to being at Bloedel and the kinds of um, synthesis, syntheses that happen between you being there and understanding it, kind of peeling back the layers of being in this environment where I think a lot of people may come to Bloedel for the first time and know that it's a garden, but it's it's a very curated space. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not really being very clear with the question. I, I think can run I, with that a little. Yeah, I think okay. I'm really interested in the fact that you pointed out that there was that space where there was a natural occurrence with the tree that was then left intentionally as this kind of residue of a natural occurrence but the intention with which it was left for viewers to see it becomes a curatorial act. And I'm wondering about um, if you just want to add anything to that. Yeah, I mean, the first place my mind went with the ideas you're putting out there is, for me, the idea of return. And so one of the special things about my role at Lodell over these past few years has been the ability to return. So to notice when a natural change has happened, when like in the camellia walk, for instance, there was the sword fern and the camellias that I spent in hours and hours studying and painting. And then I come back and it's completely uplifted and that theater is no longer there. Mm -hmm. And so returning has a really meaningful thing to me where watching and witnessing those changes, but also even outside of just return, spending time in nature has this incredible sensuous effect where these narratives start to come up, memories of childhood and it's something about, again, about that wall of the self and the other being dissolved by nature. And so all these archetypes start to come up. Like I talked about even just like the cycle of life and death. So leaving a log and letting it be and do its thing that the great classroom, you know, nature is that classroom to learn so much about how to live with death, how to live with our own consciousness. And then specifically, of course, in the garden, like you're saying that that is a curated decision, right? We're not in the wild forest. We are in a very curated space where that fallen tree has been left in order for us to witness the changes that it's going through. And so it is a consciousness. It's a laboratory. It has a connection with the human where both get to thrive. We get to learn and the law gets to be left alone. So all of its friendly neighbors that it's gotten to know through its root system over hundreds of years are still there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that, that that it makes me think, uh, you know, that the idea of garden terminology, you know, uh, pruning and you plant where you are or thrive where you're planted. I mean, there's a, we use a lot of language from the garden in our discussions about human behavior and human connections. And I love that you are taking language from the theater and the lighting. And I loved the idea that you were, um, you were basically cobbling together a score from these different images. I mean, that yes. you're using this kind of performative, in the best sense of the word, performance-based language to talk about the garden. So that, yeah, that I love that, Chris, and I'm interested in vocabularies and language swapping places. And so the language of gardening to apply that to painting has been insanely um, exciting to me, right? Taking a specific plot of land or a canvas and cultivating poetic meaning within those strict boundaries mm -hmm. and meaning that necessarily must be able to change and grow. Mm -hmm. Like those are incredible crossovers. Yeah, it's a great place to start. I mean, to, to start and return to, mm -hmm. def definitely. Um, I want to share a question from an audience member. Lori uh, mentions that your greens 
the greens in your work are impressive. And she wonders what media you use. She is chemically sensitive, so can't use solvents. And I think there's a question underlying there that, that is asking for a recommendation. Uh, well, I do use oils for the most part. I just love the aliveness of it, the kind of way that it stays wet and I can keep moving it around. Um, I don't use a lot of solvent. I just use a little bit of odorless mineral spirits um, and a little bit of oil, but I really try to keep it very simple. But I've also really fallen in love uh, with gouache. Um, although it dries very fast, you can use a wet palette. So a sponge that stays wet that you put the gouache on and the gouache has this beautiful flat matte velvety finish to it. And so doing plein air with gouache or doing color studies with gouache is just so wonderful. So that's what I recommend to you. If you're at all sensitive to solvents with oil, just forget about it. Move to the gouache. I prefer it to acrylic. I don't like working with the shiny tackiness of polymer as much. Um, what's great about gouache is it's just the colored pigment and then it's using chalk instead of polymer as the binder. Uh, so a really lovely, I think, uh, yeah, method for working. I can attest to that gouache is, it, it is, velvety is the word that mm -hmm. describes it when it dries. It has this kind of, it, it's, it really is, it's so matte and so non-reflective. It's and so wonderful. Saturated. And, and you can water it down. You can make it more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have a, options between like transparent versus opaque, which is yeah. really nice. Yeah. Um, you had also a, another question about what the thin white lines are that are intersecting some of the images. Yeah, I get that question a lot. And in fact, I've heard from the docents here at the museum that that is the most asked question in the show. <laughs> and it's a great question. Um, there are different ways I can kind of approach that question. One, I'd say in the camellia walk panels, for instance, if you'll recall in some of the images I showed, those collages where I'm sort of piecing it together, the gridded lines become a kind of tempo or rhythm, like a music score. And so it's showing movement through time. Um, but it also, in just a purely formal way, it's a way of gridding and parsing up the rectangle in order to focus on smaller parts of it. Because when faced with the complexity and enormity of nature, it's impossible to take it all in. And so the gridded line is admitting and talking about the fact that perception is something we are constantly pacing to get uh, pasting together that never really quite adds up. And then the grid becomes to mean something a little bit different in a piece like Light in the Cedars. Um, that grid becomes more about the revelation of sacred geometry, that when we are moved by nature, we are moved by our interconnectedness with it, that we are not separate from it, and that our cells are the same cells, like that me and the camellia and the fern were all part of a kind of secret, uh, sacred growth pattern uh, that has a geometry to it. And so the grid has a lot of wonderful meanings to me. It also has the sort of Cezannean idea of allowing the process to be revealed. Like I'm not interested in cleaning up my paintings. Like I want them to reveal the process of their own making. And so when I'm making these paintings, each time I come back into the studio, I'm reiterating that grid. It's a way for me to come back into the painting and reestablish the surface. And so sometimes that gets all covered up and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the painting comes to fruition and completion with those lines there as part of its structural and visual integrity. Yeah, that, that is acknowledging that it's in there regardless of whether it's visible is really right right yeah and all of the paintings in the show are rigorously geometric and mm. composed like I love that stuff well you have a question that I'm going to combine with a question of my own um, about 
um, just acknowledging the beautiful opportunity that has been offered to you and to Blodell by that relationship. I know that you've also recently, I think just recently completed a residency at Oxbow and um, that you are a longtime and dedicated teacher at Gage. And um, we were fortunate to have you teach a little guest workshop at BIMA. And the relationship between um, residencies, which I think of as a time of really soaking in and kind of hovering over the life that you live on a daily basis and that kind of replenishing or open cracking yourself open and teaching which is commonly seen as a an output oriented although we know as teachers that there is a lot of exchange that happens so how did these things um, how do these things work in your life and the question actually that was posed and also how does the exhibit relate to this and i know this is probably a really meaty answer and uh so I'll just let you know there are a couple more questions after this. So uh, sure. Yeah. Um, whew, well, first of all, <laughs> life is all about balance, right? Trying to balance the different parts. And as I've grown more into who I am as a creative person, my balance requires an enormous amount of solitude and recharging my battery. And when I can do it in nature, all the better. And so a residency, doing residencies, like I've done them in Spain and Portugal and over in Twist, actually have set up a really great uh, model for me, sort of philosophically even. And I think that it's this way for many artists too, where this designated amount of time, whether it be two weeks or a month, is all about me walking into the unknown. My creative self gets full range here. And so even when I'm not doing a residency, I love thinking in the residency way. It has changed the way I think of my own home and my studio and my back garden. Like if I have a weekend free, then I'm on residency. Like I'm on top hat studio residency. And so it's a way of thinking and encouraging total playfulness and exploration. For me, the balance between that very solitary creative act and my most outward facing uh, part of my life, of course, is teaching, is finding that balance where the teaching is part of my creative practice. That's where it's at its best. When I can share some of the questions that I have in my own practice with my students and get them involved, like we're in the laboratory together, then it's almost like I've pulled one over because it's like, I get to stay in that awesome creative space and get to communicate and discuss it with my awesome students. And so it's taken you know, over a decade for me to get to a place as a teacher where I both am able to pull down that threshold or that boundary between my creative life and my teaching life, and yet at the same time learn a different kind of boundary where I'm really able to meet each individual where they're at in their practice. And so it, it's a constant balance. Mm -hmm. um, and then with bringing in this project and the show, um, it has somehow worked out for me. I have to say too, this past year with COVID and it's allowed for a lot more focus for me. Uh, for one thing, my teaching moving online has actually, I'd say 90% of that has been totally positive for me. Um, I've loved it. I've still been able to maintain a real connection with my students. Um, but I think for a lot of us, um, especially for my students, I love that they have in a way been forced to set up their creative practice wherever they are, which in a way is the first thing you got to learn as an artist, right? It's not like, oh, go to school and then you leave school. And it's like, oh no, what do I do? Now it's like, 
you guys have all set up your practice with me witnessing you and mentoring you through that. And when you're done with the program, look, you already have designed what it means to be a creative person in your domestic sphere, which is where you've got to carve space for it or it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And so all of that has been super positive. Yeah. That, um, I cannot agree with you more about that carving out space. I mean, if you're, if you're thinking and behaving creatively in your daily life, you are thinking and creatively, you're accessing those skills when you go to the studio. And yeah. yeah. Was it Annie Lamott who said the sum of your days is how you live. I, this, each living each day is the way you live your life something like that, mm -hmm. poorly paraphrased. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question um, about being at the reflection pond and combining that with another question about being at Bloedel again, um, th that kind of relationship that, how do you see sustaining this relationship both in communicating with your subject matter and um, continuing your work in relation to Lodell? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't know specifically what's gonna happen. My dream and what I envision is that, you know, a decade from now and then a decade from then and a decade from then, I can kind of return and continue this incredible relationship that I've started over the past three years. So it's by no means for me done, whether or not I'm invited to the creative program again, I don't know, but I can always go to Bloedel and experience it again. I want to be part of longer lasting conversations with Bloedel, with the creative programming, with other national gardens, perhaps. I really believe in this model of creative thinkers coming into a garden specifically, again, a natural space that's cultivated by humans and to have it be a laboratory or think tank for transformations to happen. So I'm really inspired by that uh, collaboration that has happened. And it is a part, again, it's a conversation I want to be part of on a much larger scale. Mm -hmm. Well, I saved, I saved one question for the end. Um, Ashwini asks. Hi, Ashwini. Yeah, says, uh, they're beautiful paintings and they must feel like your children. <laughs> your, uh, can you, I mean, this is a horrible thing to ask of any parent, you know, which one is your favorite? <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Oh, do you have a favorite or, you know, like I, I actually want to expand on the question a little bit. Um, what is bringing you joy right now in your work as you anticipate it moving forward? Mm. Well, you know, it, of course, it's hard to answer my favorite. Um, the one I always think of, though, to me is like the sort of like secret mama's favorite is light in the light in the forest annunciation. Mm -hmm. um, it's the one with the shaft of light and the peonies. And there's something about the paint handling in that work that is more free and physical and sensual in a way that was surprising to me. Uh, that being said though, the camellia walk panels are enormously important to me. Those were paintings that in a way I've been trying to make for 20 years. And so those to me are like the meaty kind of backbone of the entire exhibition. Uh, what I'm excited about right now is that my peonies are growing and that I'm going to make the sweetest painted love to them for the next <laughs> few weeks and that's as far as I'm trying to look ahead right now oh, just so me good. and the peonies that's so good yeah well I just want to say a huge thank you to um the the beautiful descriptive language that you used and the the love that you made to the work and to all of us <laughs> making love that's what it, i do <laughs> it, was so, it was lovely to have you um Thank i do want to say that this uh 
talk was recorded. And so if anybody out there would like to share it in the future, give us a little bit of time. We'll be posting it to our YouTube channel and um, it should be available shortly. Awesome. Um, but in the meantime, you've had a couple of nice comments. One more came in. Uh, you got a thank you and a thank you for the purple truck. <laughs> oh yeah, baby. So, thank you. <laughs> to shout out to Hunter Stroud for being the back end technician here and helping us out today. Really yeah, the man behind you. the curtain. <laughs> it's actually in the front of the curtain. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, a lot of you probably know me personally and just know that this project for me has been a game changer, a life changer. So thank you so much again, Kristen. I really appreciate you hosting this and creating this space. Well, we're honored, honored to have you. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye.